Welcome to Movie Heaven, Movie Hell with me, Simon Aiken and... And I'm Keith Isles and we are both independent filmmakers who enjoy discussing movies and related media. And for this episode, we're really pleased to be joined by two guests. We have actors and filmmakers Ben Shockley and Mark Noyce on the line. Welcome, guys. How you doing, guys? You all right? We're good. Yep. Uh, good, good to have you joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about a, a film uh, called The Blazing Cannons, which... Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you, I know you're both obviously star in it, but you also uh, co-wrote and co-directed and co-produced this film as well. Is that correct? It is correct. Yeah, most, yeah, of, it, um, most of that's correct. <laughs> I produced it, but yeah, it was all. Yeah, I didn't really co-produce it. But. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Well, we'll talk about the origins of all that, sure. but before before we do. Ben, I know you've been on the um, on the podcast uh, before, yeah, yeah. but for the benefit of any listeners that didn't hear that episode, and they should have done, obviously. But yeah, yeah. Um, uh, can you can you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and 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 what you do? Well, um, I've been an actor for <clears throat> well over twenty years. Um, started off in theatre, really. Uh, what's that? Don't look old enough, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> a, a child actor obviously ben something yeah. like that the checks in the post <laughs> by the way <laughs> um yeah and uh, well i started off in theater uh, then i moved into like doing acting in short films then did the odd one or two feature films and really the last oh 10 oh no even longer than that since about 2005 or 6 i've been sort of concentrating on getting parts in indie feature films really either leads or sort of small character parts um and i write as well but uh, um i'd never written a feature film before uh, let alone co-written one uh, i'd always stuck to shorts or, or plays or whatever um but um without sort of licking mark's um some things too much um without mark um i wouldn't have been able to do it so you know he gave me the opportunity Fabulous, fabulous. And obviously, um, Mark, myself and Ben have, have, have worked together uh, on many occasions and known each other for some time. Um, but uh, obviously, I, I first met you at the screening uh, of, of this feature. So um, can you uh, can you give us a bit of your background, please? Yeah. So again, my I'm a, I'm a film film producer. Um, did sort of start off really doing um, stunt work actually because my background's in martial arts so I kind of uh, fell into doing a little bit of stunt work here and there really enjoyed it then like everybody else I wanted a little line and then I wanted a, a longer line and it kind of grew from there but the whole filmmaking thing really came from just finding the whole process interesting I had some ideas on stuff that I found funny that was all based around my martial arts days, really. And I wrote a film called On the Ropes, which I actually cast Ben in. So Ben kind of co-starred in that. And that kind of started out sort of working together. Although we did meet on a previous film, that was the first time me and him really um, sort of started working together in such a large capacity. So, yeah, that's, that's me, really. Oh, fabulous. And, um, uh, y you know, ov obviously Simon and I have both uh, had the opportunity to uh, – to come to screenings of the blazing cannons um yes. and obviously yeah uh, you know very very enjoyable sort of uh you know comedy action thriller sort of inspired by you know movies of the 70s etc but i mean do, do you do you want to without any major spoilers because obviously we want people to go see this but can, can you give us a little bit of a, a lowdown on the on the on the plot and characters please yeah, well, I'll, um, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the plot if you want, and then I'll let Ben elaborate on the characters a little bit. Um, but basically, um, both of us are, are massive 70s fans, as I'm, I'm sure you already know. And uh, we just wanted to do something that was a little bit of fun, but also paying a bit of homage to the films that we sort of grew up watching. And, um, you know, the plot isn't particularly complex, really. We wanted to start with something really simple. And it is um, two cops that are basically obsessed with the 1970s, so we both sort of write what we know, right, Ben? Um, That's right. And, uh, yeah. And are obsessed with 70s films and very much kind of portray um, these 70s cop heroes. And that's how they kind of see themselves. That is not how everybody else sees them, by the way. Everybody else thinks they're, um, 
yeah, well, politely put, you know, about Blancas, really. <laughs> but they, they see themselves as these 70s sort of <laughs> show heroes and want to go out there and there's a serial killer on the loose, which they um, sort of chase. But that's that, in, in short, is the plot. Without wanting to give too much away, there are a few little twists and turns into it, which I don't really want to go go down that route too yeah, much yet. no spoilers. No, absolutely. Yeah. But um, the characters, really, yeah, just something me and Ben's kind of worked on. So mine, mine really was, again, just characters I tend to do around the house, much to the annoyance of my wife, really, um, <laughs> which is how a few films of mine have come out about, just something I'll tend to mess about with. And, and Ben's character, as I'm sure he'll tell you a bit more about, was um, a, a role I think he always dreamed to play, wasn't it, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Well, when, um, when we first had a discussion about what film we might do next, um, I think you basically said to me, if you had the chance to direct and write and be in any genre of film you could, what would it be? Yeah. And I said, well, buddy cop movie, probably. Um, <laughs> because, as you all know, the whole, again, the whole 70s thing, you know, I, I was brought up on things like Starsky and Hutch and the Western series, alias Smith and Jones and things like that, and Clint Eastwood, obviously. And I thought, well, let's try and amalgamate all of that and get that buddy thing going Um you, you know, it's they're too obviously they're very close, <laughs> very close um, <laughs> to the characters, and you can read in it what you like. I mean, people read in all sorts of things about buddy movies, which might not even be there. But <laughs> it, it was well, it was a whole thing about exploring the two friends, two male friends, or or female friends can be very close friends without it having to be sexually orientated if you know what I mean you know I've got some very good close male friends and I, I would say that I you know love them I haven't had a drink either so I don't even know why I'm talking about this <laughs> but that, that's what we wanted I kind of um, thought it'd be fun to explore that side of it um, I'm not coming out by the way I'm just, you know, <laughs> just, just thought I'd mention that um, yeah yeah, so it's, you know, it's based on, you know, people like Pete Doyle and Paul Michael Glaser and David Soule and Ben Murphy and all that, all those kinds of people. Um, and, you know, when we discussed about, right, well, what, what would be the plot then? You know, you go through, well, what, what's it going to be, a serial killer movie? Is it going to be like a um, an underworld sort of drug kingpin that we have to bring down or, you know, that sort of stuff? But we thought, well, let's let's go serial killer um, base things slightly dirty Harryish, you know, and and that sort of stuff. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, what what made me laugh, Ben, is essentially in this movie, um, you it's you in all your normal clothes that you wear, <laughs> just with a wig on. That's right. <laughs> Basically, which which uh, which amused me no end. But I mean, I know I I know that's that's more because I know you rather than, than than the film itself there. But 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 the film the film was very amusing also. Um, but tell us a bit. Of, I mean, you, you sort of mentioned how the origins of the project came around. But you, you know, the film the the film was made on a very low budget is my understanding and that kind of works for the film so mm. do you want to sort of you know explore that a little bit and, and tell us a little bit more about that mark do you want to yeah so um so, so base, basically what happened was um, i'm actually, I'm actually working on another project um, which i was working on before blazing cannons and um it's it's a film i co-wrote with sean williamson and uh some of were getting off the ground and we were still writing it and as we started to write it basically it, it grew and grew and grew and it became more ambitious um and so while we were kind of waiting for finance and things to come in i was like well i don't really want to sit around and wait for one and this is when ben was around because ben is also involved in um this is jade as well he's he's casting that and uh, we even shot some test scenes didn't we ben quite a while uh, back yeah yeah and um and basically, I sort of said, well, look, I want to, I want to do something in between. I don't want to sit and wait because I'm a big believer in you learn by doing. You know, everything I've done so far, film wise, I look at it afterwards and go, wow, if I did that again, I'd learn this and this. And, and you know, you learn by going through the whole process, I believe. So I said, well, look, let's let's do something. I've got a minimal budget. This is what I've kind of got available that we can spend on it. And again, I always think that if if you're writing and directing, it kind of can go hand in hand because I know in my head, right, I know what budget I've got. So I'm not going to write something that I can't physically make. You know, I'm not going to write um, a helicopter flying over New York, crashing into the sea and then monsters coming out of the sea. And, you know, because I can't afford to produce that. So we wrote within the constraints of the budget. 
And it was that that partially kind of made me and Ben go, well, do you know what? We look at some of the old stuff that was done on like a shoestring, particularly more TV series. Why don't we do something like that in the same style? And then when we have issues with continuity, we can sort of have a joke on it. So it kind of worked, but it did in a way backfire because once we kind of set going down that route of all these continuity issues, we had to put them in deliberately. And um, I'll probably let Ben go into a couple of these, but that became a lot harder than I thought. I thought we could be a little bit lazy and actually no we had to write them in and we had to get costume changes halfway through scenes and things moving in the background and it actually made life a bit hard for itself didn't it ben (laughs) well as we said yeah it was like then we had to look through and go right sometimes it was on the day actually we'd go yeah we'd suddenly go oh wow well well she's got two different costumes why doesn't she oh i don't want to give too much away (laughs) why don't she go go into one room we're wearing one costume and then when she's in the other room, she's got another costume on. See if anyone notices. Uh, there's other bits as well. We Obviously, we put a 70s grade on the film, and Jump Cuts was another idea that we had. Yeah. Again, in, inspired by other films. Well, f- films that were made in the 70s, which haven't had been remastered that you see, that have loads of Jump Cuts in. And also, obviously, I, I, I would say um, an inspiration would have been Death Proof, wouldn't it, as well, Mark? Absolutely, yeah. Quentin Tarantino, brilliantly done, I thought. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and what was quite funny was um, we only sent the section of the script to actors um, for the bits they needed to play. So some of the scenes, for example, are quite sort of grim and very sort of Alfred Hitchcock sort of look, really. That's what sort of inspired me to do some of those scenes and shoot them the way we did. But uh, the actors didn't know that it was a comedy, some of them. So they'd only read their scenes. Then halfway through this particular one, said to this woman, okay, can you just halfway through, Kurt, right, can you change outfits? And she's going, um, won't that be strange because it's the same scene. She's like, just do it. You'll see. Because <laughs> they didn't, they had no idea. So that was quite an eye-opener for them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the whole experience for me was just absolutely brilliant. And as you know, being filmmakers, you know, although the filming is a difficult, difficult part, you know, the edit and all that kind of stuff, you know, your work hasn't even started yet, you know. <laughs> That's right. Can I just can I just ask uh, about that uh, point about the um, actress who was a bit confused by the costume change? Um, do you feel that it helps that they didn't know that it was a comedy, or do you think it might have hindered it in some way? I think for the particular scenes that we chose to do that, it worked because they were very serious scenes. We wanted we wanted the film to be played straight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we didn't want it to be, you know, kind of any nods to it. So yeah. at no point in the film do the cast ever kind of make note of how ridiculous some of the stuff that's going around them is or, or reference it. So I think for some of it, it kind of worked. Um, yeah. Like I said, the only thing that was a little bit concerning was when we got to the premiere. And I remember just beforehand saying to Ben, this is gonna this is gonna be interesting because people <laughs> some of them are sat there they've done like a really gruesome kind of like scary scene no idea that it's a comedy and about to sit there and watch this film that's just going to be ridiculous in places and it, yeah that was quite <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah. there's there's two scenes in the film that I think are absolutely inspired one being the um, the the party Robert Johnny's right, party yeah. and the other one was the commercial. Oh, right. <laughs> so um for those scenes were the act well obviously the commercial one the actor certainly must have been in on a joke because he had to, to to perform what he had to perform but the the party scene were the actors on in on the joke on that one or were they just playing that really seriously do you want to answer this one ben well i mean obviously as you said the 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 commercial was obviously set up especially to be that that way mm-hmm. um and we wanted something at the time, I mean, without any copyright issues, but, um, we wanted something the killer was going to use that was kind of current at the start, the time we started making the film. OK. And there, were cer- uh, there was a certain product, I can't say what it is, that was um, on sale at that point. And we thought, well, let's, let's base it on that. Um, and then I think it was Mark that said, well, let's do one better. Let's actually film the advert. Mm. And that at some point... Shot- wasn't it first thing we actually ever shot it was actually yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, there was a little bit of again there was a continuity bit that again we thought of on the day which i think i've seen in something else but it, it we we i loved it is um i don't know if i can mention it but there's a can i give something away yeah it's fine yeah well there's a bit where 
the two girls are playing with these these what we call Betty bands in the film, and <laughs> I think one of their relatives had come to the shoot with them. That's and right. Yeah. He had really big arms and tattoos, and we thought, let's cut him in uh, as the young girl playing with the Betty band. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. I forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> and he was really up for it, so we thought we'd, we'll bung that in as well. Um, yeah, yeah, what was going on? Did she bless her? It was a friend of uh, mine who played the part. Um, and the party because- scene was kind of... We cast... I think you cast most of them, didn't you, through Star Now, Mark? Correct, yes, yeah. So obviously they got paid and everything and, and they had to be there. And I think we must have just done a, a rough description of what, what was required of them, that they'd be need to be, wear their their clothes that they would wear in a sort of scantily sort of clad party type thing. Yeah, yeah. And then um, obviously when we did the party and we did the, you know, um, pass to pass and that kind of stuff, then it's all a good. And then they all started sort of really enjoying it because they suddenly realised, oh, my God, this isn't just a serious scene is it so they kind of got wind that something was um and we, we did the, the twister we as well didn't, you? Party, didn't we we just had a party really basically <laughs> we had a party um we i don't think we drank any alcohol did we no we didn't no 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 of course we wouldn't we wouldn't have done <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. I, I ordered the yeah, I, I, off amazon and you want to see some of the suggestions i get now oh i'm sure <laughs> Yeah. I was all, oh, I, you might be interested in this fetish outfit. Yeah, yeah. and, <laughs> well, we and were, you just you just tell your wife it's because of the film, dear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's going on two years afterwards. <laughs> um, but an interesting thing is, um, we did discuss at one point whether we should turn up at the party in the same kind of gear, didn't we, Mark? We actually we've actually got the outfits. Oh, I've got, got the outfits. That's right. I actually have a picture of us both in the outfits when we tried them on to decide whether we should go for it or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very brave. Very brave. Um, tell you a funny, funny little story though, if that's okay, about the um, party. We we hired a venue, so we've got all these kind of uh, models arriving, and they're in stockings and suspenders, and one oh, had a wig. Yeah. And um, during during coffee breaks, the girls would go outside. It was a really really hot day. I can't remember what month we filmed it in, but it was really hot. Mm-hmm. And obviously, all dancing around, and they got leather on and all things. And the, the venue we'd hired next door. There was a children's party being run. <laughs> <laughs> so all these parents are arriving, and um, there's these girls out styling, stocking and suspenders, practicing with their whip. <laughs> it was, it was got some funny looks. All the women sort of looked us up and down a bit, and uh, a few of the dads were kind of like trying to see what was going on. Weren't they? <laughs> well, they were quite interested. They spent most of the time outside the pool, yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it was just, oh, what a dad to pick. <laughs> so, uh, how long did it take to film? That scene? No, the whole film. Um, we did days here and there, which I, I, I remember saying to Ben, I probably wouldn't do that again. I thought it'd be easier because I was fitting it in around other things, but actually it wasn't. Made it a lot harder because con- I know the continuity was an issue, but I'm talking even from a playing a character point of view. If you do three or four days, have two weeks off, film another couple of days, it it's difficult, more difficult to get into the swing of things. I wouldn't do that again, but I'd say... Start to end year, Ben. Maybe slightly more because we did we did have a break part way through, didn't we? And then we yeah. sort of resumed afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I think we shot one one we sh- we shot part of it one year and the, and and then it went to the second year, I think. Yeah, I mean it wasn't a massive amount of days, was it? I think it was in like the high twenties, maybe. Yeah, Patrick. when you add them all together, yeah. um, we, we basically did weekends, didn't we? And then we did the odd block, I think, of about three or four days or something, or three yeah. days. Um, and it was, as you say, it was, it was working around other people's schedules as well, of course. Yeah. yeah. Which is the yeah. tricky bit. Well, I, um, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think what you did that's really smart and the thing that I'm, I'm sort of major impressed by here is, is, is obviously, you know, that the, the film is very amusing and works and, and, you know, uh, you know, has all of those tropes and, and homages and, and, you know, the sort of. Uh, satirical feel, et cetera, to it. But what 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 you did that was, I think, really smart, um, based on on the fact that you had, you know, the the low budget and, like you said, the very sort of split up filming schedule, et cetera, was the fact that, um, you, you know, you chose the sort of tone and style of the of the film to be that way. So production problems, like you said, such as continuity. 
if there were any accidents in amongst the you know you know the deliberate continuity errors but also <laughs> also <laughs> yeah but also you know production problems as well like you know technical ones like sound and camera and all that sort of thing you can mm. kind of get away with it to a certain extent because of the because of the nature of you know the style of the film that you've gone for and i think that's yeah. i think that's really smart because uh, you, you you know you made that a feature of the film and yeah. therefore you, you know budget having little budget and stuff kind of worked in its favor rather than you, you know most people who don't have a high budget that try and make something you know they'll try and do like a uh, a serious high action movie or or something and and when you haven't got the budget and those things don't work and it isn't done with sort of tongue in cheek it 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 then comes across like a sort of amateur film whereas mm. in your case it comes across really well because that's what you set out to 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 do and i think that's what was uh what was really clever in terms of the uh creative choices behind what you what you did here and it really works you know <laughs> that's, that's good to know that's cool yeah that's cool. appreciate that uh, yeah, I mean, there was. Can I just say there was another couple of characters actually we liked as well that were in. Um, I think it was Boogie Nights, wasn't it, Mark? Boogie Nights, yeah, Mark Wahlberg, yeah, great film. Bert when they do the um, the fake fake cop sort of, they do a, like a trailer to something, don't they? <laughs> yeah, oh uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, brilliant. and we thought, oh, that looks good. I mean, that that's nice. You know, it kind of fits in with what we're trying to do. Like. It was the nice bit that we where we did a walk towards the camera, didn't we, Mark? And we wanted to have the, the whole crutch filling the shot sort of yeah. thing, you know, as you're walking <laughs> towards. I noticed well, it, they picked your picked your crutch and not mine. It just looks better. Was that an edit? Was that was that an edit decision? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. Um, I mean, I noticed there was another film that came out um, uh, recently, or I say recently, about a year ago. Um, called Mindhorn, and uh, it, yep. it, it, it's quite uncanny because some of the sort of I, I know you hadn't even seen it, and you were making it at the same time as they were making mm. this film um, with with obviously a bigger budget they were making it with. But um, some of the sort of uh, choices and winks and tropes and sort of uh, style of the jokes and whatever are quite similar, actually. I mean, the the plot's very different, but the uh, the, the 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 sort of you know seventies guy trapped in in the sort of contemporary world, you, you mm -hmm. know, the fish out of water thing from that point of view um, w w was quite similar. So I don't know whether you have seen that one, but uh, it, it, check it out because you'll probably get a kick out of it because it's definitely the same sort of genre. I would say, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I was aware of the film and I remember you mentioned it to me, Keith. I really want to see it, actually, I have to say. Mm. Um, there was another thing as well. I, we in, in some of our early publicity, um, we didn't we get onto the BBC website, um, Mark, or BBC comedy website or something? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I can't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, it was one of those. Yeah. Yeah, and then shortly afterwards, you know, we'd 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 mentioned the plot on there, and there's, and I'm not pointing fingers at any big uh, corporations on TV, but um, feels there was like a tea, are. Eh? feels like you are. Um, maybe I am. <laughs> um, there was a series. I can't remember what it was called, but there was actually a TV series, and it was on something like BBC Four, or if there was a BBC Three or something like that, and it was a thing about a seventies cop duo. Now, it was based in the 70s, actually, as well. And they had, like, uh, driving through cardboard boxes, you know, mannequins in, in, in certain scenes and stuff like that. And I thought it almost like someone's read the plot of our film and gone, oh, we're going to quickly sort of rush a series through based on a similar thing. And that's what it felt like. But the difference being, it wasn't funny. Uh, ah, there you oh, go. Because that never happens, does it? Nobody no. ever steals <laughs> ideas from somebody right. else based well, we'd on never, We'd never do that, would we, Mark? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Don Siegel I hear on the phone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. <laughs> Not the other line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, no, it, it really is. I mean, obviously, we can't say too much more about the actual uh, plot or, or anything without 
without going into spoiler territory, and I d- definitely don't want to do that for you. But in terms of where you're at with it now, I know you've had a few screenings. Um, y- y- you know, what what's next? How how will people be able to get access to this? Are you working on? you know, distribution, et cetera. What, what, where, where are you currently at with the project? So, yeah, just, just to, um, organising all the distribution details uh, um, as we speak, really. Been quite been quite lucky because um, I, I did a similar sort of thing to what I did with my first film. And again, I've been very fortunate, really, that I happened to know a couple of people that were able to help me out. And so for my first film, On the Ropes, I, I was adamant I wasn't going to shoot anything until I had a distribution deal. Um, in place, so we didn't didn't shoot a single scene until I had a, a distribution agreement, and at the time that was Cornerstone, so it got out in HMV and stuff. But um, my, my purpose for that really was, I'm not I'm not able. It was the size of the budget. People aren't coming on this film to earn loads and loads and loads of money. So if actors are coming to work on one of my films, then at least they deserve is to have their film out there and get it released. So I found it easier to attract good actors having a guaranteed distribution than than anything, as I'm sure everyone who's an actor would appreciate that. And as I say, I've been there. So for this film, it was the same. I kind of had, I had an agreement um, that I, so I knew, I knew I could get it distributed. It was just how, how widely really. And um, since we've done it, we've had, we've had a, so we've had four screenings. We've had a couple of other distributors contact us, which has been really, really nice. So we're just going through sort of like the fine details at the moment. I'm hoping in the next few weeks, we should have, should have some, details that I can confirm and give a release date hopefully oh fantastic um, yeah so uh, yeah fingers crossed well, no, one thing we are going to do in fact um, we're meeting up this weekend because we're going to work on a trailer yes oh okay yeah so Which hopefully that's going to be people soon yeah so we've got we've been sort of discussing notes and stuff like that as we all know there's more than one way to skin a cat as it were so we're going to discuss it in you know which way we can go with it i guess and, and try a few ideas out aren't we yeah i think the problem is is so because the style of film it is there's so many ways we could go with the trailer yeah mm. yeah and we keep we keep I've got several versions here and mm. i'm not really sure so yeah that's ben's coming this weekend and we need to get that done because again distribution need that yeah, so uh, I'm I'm quite surprised there hasn't you guys haven't put a trailer out so far. I mean, the fact that you're already screening and stuff. I mean, uh, a lot of filmmakers tend to, you know, put a trailer together before the film is finished. Yeah, I didn't want to do that really because I, um, I, I kind of made a bit of a mistake with the last one because what I did there, I was very excited as well. I was keen to get a trailer done, mm-hmm. and the problem is then I got a trailer out there, and um, you know, people were looking at them, and really. It, kind of uh, peaked a bit too early with it that by the time the film came out okay i could put the trailer out there again but people are like i've seen this and so i really want to try and hold it back until i at least got a release date really oh okay uh, makes sense plan. but uh yeah yeah well like yeah. you said you're learning you're learning from what you've previously done and uh you, you know that that that's good you're 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 definitely uh from the sounds of it mark an, an experiencer rather than a conceptualizer with all this stuff so yes. uh yeah, you know, yeah. good, good, good for you. <laughs> Independent film world needs that. So, um, uh, you, you know, uh, very well done for for, for, for for taking that stance with it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now, this I think you know everybody's different, but I, I tend to learn by doing rather than sitting and trying to theor- theoretically think about everything and read lots of books. But I, you know, I think you know, blazing cannons. Even I mean, the amount me and Ben have learned, I think, from starting to finishing is. Just leagues apart, which will carry through onto the next one, the next one, hopefully. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. No, it's what, what, what would you say then in terms of the actual production? Um, what what was the, you know, what was the biggest challenge on it? Or what or what, what was the most difficult thing that, that, that happened during production? For, um, for me, scheduling is the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, and I say, and that's where probably for the next one, I'm, I'm pretty keen that I want to shoot in um, over a small, a shorter period of time. I found scheduling people for the odd day here and there was quite difficult. Um, even down to like one of the girls that was in it was messaging me saying, oh, by the way, I want to get my hair cut this weekend. Is that going to be a problem? And it's like, well, for this film, no. <laughs> for, <laughs> for anything. <laughs> um, so for, for me, the, the scheduling everybody, just logistics of getting everybody in the right place, on location, getting the right venue, and just 
all of that side to it. Rather than the creative side, it was more the, the general just logistics, really. Um, I don't know what Ben would say, but that, that was it for me. Yeah, I mean, locations, obviously. Um, again, I don't want to spoil a, do a spoiler here, but there was one location we used in the film. Um, we planned to do quite a lot, and we realised when we were there... Um, I mean, Mark made the decision because he's obviously he's got the money and he had to, you know, hire this venue. And I think part way through, we just decided, look, let's not rush this. We're going to have to come back in a few weeks' time and and shoot here again. Yeah, I think you. Well, I think you know what place I mean. Yeah, don't you? I, yeah. I don't. I don't know what it cost, and I'm not going to say because of the. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, but whatever it was, Mark, it was worth every penny because that sequence was unique and fun and yeah really makes it so oh, i think it's well worth it yeah <laughs> yeah well, I, think, I think what happened was we underestimated um how much we could shoot in one go there's quite a lot of dialogue in there as well so yeah. it's kind of like the action scene there's a lot of dialogue and uh yeah i think we just underestimated it but then what tended to happen was because we were thinking well actually we've only got another three hours in here and oh that's two hours Mm. We start to put a little bit too much pressure on ourselves, and then as yeah. I said, I think got got to the last hour, and I was like, "Look, this is pointless. We're going to rush in it. We're not going to end up with anything. Yeah. We'll, book it. we'll do another session, and that's that's what we did." But uh, yeah, yeah was, you know, and, and what and what was genius with that as well is you subverted the trope, which uh, which I like. Mm. But yeah. as I said, we can't say any more without going into spoiler territory. But yeah. pe- people need to watch it because it's full. Of, it's full of tropes and cliches and uh, <laughs> you know nods. But you do subvert uh, some of the tropes as well, and I think that's a, that was a very clever move. So um, y- y- you know, I appreciate a lot of your budget might have gone on that, but it was well <laughs> worth it. I think. i have to ask as co-directors how did you go about the the about directing the other actors was did you have like um you know one person would do this or one person would do you know do like one 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 person talks to the actors the other talks to the cameraman how did you um split the duties up i mean we fell out every day (laughs) (laughs) every day (laughs) <laughs> no, I think, um, well, I, I, I really, really enjoy um, directing the, the, the DOP, so the, the director of photography, because I, I tend to like putting my shot list together. And I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to knowing all my camera angles and understanding all the various rules and things that go with it. I've got books <coughs> in my office. I get a bit nerdy about it. So I quite enjoyed that. And obviously Ben's an extremely um, experienced actor, worked with lots and lots of people, not just in film either, but like TV and, and theatre. So he dealt a lot with communicating with actors, and I would deal a lot with communicating with the DOP. Obviously, it was a crossover. Yeah. And, but what made life easy was a lot of this stuff was actually discussed beforehand. So me and Ben would sit and go through it. And as you guys have worked with Ben, you know what he's like. He would, he would he'd go to bed here at midnight, get up in the morning at like six, and he'd written like three pages of notes for the day. <laughs> I don't know when. Um, but at some point during that night, he's been loads and loads of stuff. So you really mean good. you actually plan the shoot? You mean you actually plan stuff? <laughs> My really, God! Even you... not lots, lots more than you would think. Yeah. It's shocking. And really, I mean, actually, that's, that's an interesting, that, <laughs> interesting point. Is that we were quite lucky that we had access to some of the, the locations before we shot. Yeah. But there were one or two where we we couldn't get access before. And obviously, as you know, as filmmakers, then you're going in kind of blind and you're going, right, let's have a quick look around and see how this is going to work. You know, <laughs> and that that's kind of test your metal, really. Mm. Yeah, yeah they, you know. they were really the most challenging days, weren't they? I mean, we, mm. we did sketches and tried to get photos and sketches, at least plan it out. But then stuff on the day would change. But, yeah, you'd think you'd think because of the style we shot where we would allow issues and things. But as I said, even the even the jump cuts and the continuity issues, we planned it all. We planned it all. Mm. Which I think more work you do up front, the enough make take the pressure off you when you rock up on set and you've got actors mm. ready to go who want to jump, click their fingers and act straight away. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Wow, music to my ears this yeah. is, I'll tell you. It's uh, yeah, what I used to try and teach students all the time was plan it, don't just wing it. You'll make yeah. life easier for yourself. But there you I, go. I couldn't <laughs> wing it. I'm not, I'm not good enough to wing it. I need to have that plan beforehand. Uh, mm. 
So were there a few shockly strops then, Ben? <laughs> oh, no, I've got written down. I think there was a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a couple. I think what happened was, um, you know, it, it gets, it gets, you know, the pressure gets on and um, you start expecting too much sometimes, I think. And, you know, Mark pointed out to me at one point, and quite rightly so, you know, people are here to enjoy themselves. They don't want someone sometimes always going, come on, let's fucking get moving. <laughs> Bloody hell, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and and that doesn't that help. Kind of Stella's warm. I mean, what was that? Like? <laughs> yeah, yeah <if laughs> Stella's warm, I'm not happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, seriously, you know, that is, I learned a lot from that as well because it doesn't help um, having a strop on set because it's counterproductive. Um, so I shut my mouth after that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's, film sets, by their very nature, though, are, you know, stressful because, yeah. uh, you know, it, creativity and m- film magic needs to happen. But as always, you're up against time and, you know, external problems and, you know, it's, it's all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's 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 going to happen no matter how well planned you are. Things things still go wrong, don't they? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the weird thing is that directing and acting in something, as you as you know, you know, is that you have to do that, try and flick that switch when you're, it's almost like a few seconds before you go in front of the camera, you've just got to go, right, I'm, I've got to be in the scene now, I'm doing the scene, you know, and um, I must admit I didn't find that very easy. No, me, me either, I, I found that you know? very, yeah. Um, but it was well, you guys are literally in every scene, aren't you? I mean, the, the, you know, this this film, you're... Yeah, we, we wrote you're... it that way. <laughs> yeah, 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 bloody Steelers. That was part of it when Ben said he'd do the film. That was... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was um, yeah, we didn't let up, you know. Yeah, we were pretty pretty much in everything. Um, I mean, there were some bits, obviously, when it's our coverage and that, and then the other, the other director can observe what each, you know, what we're each doing, you know, that kind of stuff. But I remember reading... Um, you know, the whole the whole thing about Clint Eastwood and Play Misty for me, you know, when he directed his first movie and he said, you know, he'd he'd learn the line, switch the light off and then go, oh, shit, I've got to work out the camera angles now. Mm. And he put the light back on and then have to sort of do that side of it, you know. Yeah. So. Now, we've, we've, we've discussed that one. Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, <laughs> you, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's exciting though, and and, oh, and yeah. you know, yeah. um, you've got the, the the nice thing. The thing I always love about film, um, well, I mean, obviously I love film, but the thing I always love about film, as opposed to uh, theatre, and obviously I've done mm. some theatre work as well, is mm. with, with the theatre. You know, yes, you get the sort of instantaneous buzz because it lives in the moment, and you know, mm. it's it's kind of the the actor's medium and you know you're there and you get instant gratification and all that sort of stuff or, or not as the case may be sometimes but um but you, you know at the end when, when it's all over all you've got is kind of the memory you've you've got nothing to sort of show for it and what i love about film is is you you know you're capturing those moments and yes you manipulate them and put them together to to, to form your story and whatever but Mm. You you then have a finished product, and as you know, as long as you protect your assets, you you've got yeah. a finished product that that'll that'll live on. And uh, mm. I, I just think that's you know you know whenever whenever cameras are turning, whether they're burning you, you, you know film or whether they're capturing something digitally, it's 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 it is it is an amazing thing. I think when it happens, really yeah, do yeah. think capturing stuff is 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 still fascinating and uh you know you've got you've got something here you should be proud of anyway guys you know and, well, and we really we hope it does well we are, definitely thank you I mean, one funny thing i must say and i'm not going to go into details being a, a, a um a movie about the police essentially um we got to meet quite a lot of the local <laughs> constabulary didn't we mark yeah um yeah i think they turned up on several at least like, yeah at least three occasions we had, we actually had the armed response unit turn up once <laughs> yeah, we went a bit gorilla. We went a bit gorilla style. You see, on one or two bits, and um, yeah. Well, it, it, obviously, <laughs> because because the pair of you look so serious. I mean, <laughs> you, you you know how how anyone couldn't take your characters seriously. You, you know, I, I have no idea. 
<laughs> funny thing was the policeman came over with like the arm response unit there was a few of them they came over to ask me what was going on and i stood there in the wig in the full outfit having the conversation with them about it and they never they never laughed smiled or anything they weren't yeah they weren't, weren't too pleased yeah, yeah. Maybe, it the, maybe it was the gun that you had well the funny thing was at that time they were you've been running around here with guns and i was like no i haven't because I'd actually just finished, and you you were around the corner, sat in the car with about four guns. Me, yeah. I had no idea. I had no idea that um, right. the police had just come to talk to Mark around the corner, and there's me sitting like an absolute prick, basically, um, <laughs> thinking, oh, this is nice. And I had no idea that the police probably were going to turn up and um, find me in the car and check the car over, and I'd be absolutely, you know... With, with your seventies, with, with your seventies wig on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, you, you just need you just need a character now with a with with a mustache in there, you know, and uh, that you, would, be a, good, that would be a great idea. Maybe the sequel. Yeah, yeah. yeah you <laughs> get, you've you kind of discussed, you, haven't we, Mark? A little bit. Yeah, we have a bit. Yeah. Yeah, you got to you got to get a Lee Majors type in there. You you, you know the sort of we're, we're, the the era of the six million dollar man when he had the mustache and the <laughs> and, and and the side parting. You know that. Well, if, the... you, if you can get the wig and the mustache, um, send a photo to Mark, and you might be halfway there for the next <laughs> film. <laughs> it's that easy. <laughs> yes. Bloody hell, right. Uh, you're going to get inundated now. <laughs> if you, yeah, if you want to work with us, you're halfway there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have to ask seriously, are there plans to do a sequel or is that something that you might do uh, further down the line? Well, I don't know if you spotted it, but in the end credits, it does come up um, coming soon, Blazing Cannons to the Flaming Choppers, as I think we told it. But that was just purely tongue-in-cheek, a bit yeah. of a laugh. So yeah. many films of that era had a, had a coming soon. This, you know, all the James Bond films had the sequel in the titles, and uh, so we just added it in at last minute for a bit of a giggle, really. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> back, back to the future to did one. it as a yeah. joke, and they ended up with two sequels. Well, so yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to do one, um, but I know, I know. I mean, Mark's got quite a heavy schedule of other projects that he that he would like to do. So it, it all depends, really, doesn't it, on timings and stuff, really? Yeah, yeah and I guess how many Stellars we have this weekend. <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> what are those other things? Desperados. <laughs> oh, Desperados. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. There, there's the third film in the series. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll smash two out this weekend. I'm talking about the films, by the way. Oh. <laughs> well, well, on, on the on the subject of films, uh, as you know, obviously this 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 uh, podcast is called Movie Heaven, Movie Hell, and um, as you were, you know, clearly inspired by movies of the 70s, because let's be honest, the 70s was a really great time for uh, for films. Um, we asked you guys to, to sort of pick your your movie heaven and movie hell um, from that era, just so we could have a, a bit bit of a chat about those as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess you guys have, have got some picks lined up for us. But but before that, I mean, y you know, I want to hear you guys, uh, you, you know, the seventies, what, what, what is it, what is it about that era, uh, in particular for you each personally that, that, that you connect with? Um, I think for me, it was just felt like there was a lot of new films being made as in, you know, very different from anything else, breaking ground, particularly with some of like, the horrors. And I have to, I have to mention, um, this isn't what I've actually picked as my favourite, but I have to mention something like a, An End to the Dragon, for example, which was the film that got me into martial arts from the age of six. You know, it was 1973, I believe it was released. Um, you know, just they were groundbreaking. And like, some of the horrors, you know, a lot of the films that you see today, I think, are around because of films that were made in the 70s. And you only have to see how many remakes there are or reimaginings, as they prefer to call them. So uh, for me, that's why I think it's very creative, really good time for filmmakers in general. A lot of creativity. Um, that, that's me. Well, me, it's it's almost like, um, I mean, some of my favourite films of the 70s almost have a kind of indies feel to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I won't. I won't mention them all. But, but then, of course, at the end of the era, you've got you've got the big blockbusters. You know, you've got the Star Warses and you've got the Inca Close Encounters and that kind of stuff. 
which I also love. Um, but to me, everything got came together at the right time. You know, actors, directors, you know, cinematographers, the way they shot. I mean, it, it was just all just a... There isn't hardly a 70s film I don't like, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, even... Even my movie, Hell, was a bit of a difficult one to pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you guys read the book um, Easy Riders Raging Bulls, which uh, okay. goes through the whole um, the 70s, starting off with Easy Riders and ending with, uh, th- with the film Raging Bulls. And it goes through how the stu- studio system was dying and the indies came along and sort of, saved Hollywood and then of course mm. as you say the blockbusters came along with Jaws and Star Wars and uh, yeah. you know because I think it is a, is a, is a terrific read absolutely I've not read great. it I'd love to yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, 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 it is it is very good and I mean um, you know in, in, in a nutshell it, it kind of it, you know says about how what happened in the in that movement in the 70s was was kind of unique and will probably mm. never happen again um yeah, you know because yeah. obviously you'd moved out of the studio system era into like you said these sort of independent mavericks and stuff mm. but this was before all of the studios and stuff were were owned by large corporations mm. and yeah. therefore those 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 directors you know those 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 greats of that time they they had their sort of artistic freedom while mm. still having the, the the studio backing as well. Sure. Uh, whereas now, yeah. obviously, filmmakers that, that that do the big blockbusters have to sort of answer to the uh, the, the the corporations behind them. And and obviously, when it, in the world of television, um, you, you know, there's there's the network, the studio, the the advertisers. You know, so mm. many, so yeah. many. Um, uh, people in the chain, so it, it it was you know I'm obviously simplifying things there, but mm. it was uh, it was quite a good era for yeah. sure. Yeah, you say that though, Keith, because but during the nineties we had the independent boom again. We um, did, yes. So it you know it can come around again, and as the fact that a lot of the directors who are you know directing these big budget films all come from the indie world, so mm. yeah, Jackson yeah. and yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely, and and of course, um, another thing I think with these films as well is 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 uh, you, you know you know the the generation X, if you like, are you know our generation uh, people who were you know born in the sixties and seventies and sort of grew up in the eighties and nineties watching this stuff, you know, and uh, uh, you know, you know it, was, it was it was a good time, it was a good time. I think. I mean, I even think you know someone like Roger Corman was a great influence on people. You know, if you 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 mention, you know, you can mention the amount of directors and actors and people who have worked, who worked him, with yeah. him, you know, and then went on to make their own films. And you know, I like the there's an actor called uh, Warren Oates who is very underrated. Yeah. He's long yeah. dead, unfortunately. But I remember reading something about him, and I, I just loved the idea that he'd be making two films back to back, pretty much on the same location. <laughs> he'd go over, he'd stop one film, take a shirt off, and on the way over to the other film, he'd put a jacket on and a tie. And he'd be doing a completely different scene in another film, and then he'd have to walk back three hours later and shoot a bit in the other film. I mean, to me, that would be a dream, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> Though saying that, some of the the Roger Corman films are a bit, <laughs> yeah. a bit incoherent, especially the ones well, that they've that. done that, where they've used the same location and they've they filmed one That's film right. there and the other one they filmed as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes his. His thing was throw enough shit and some of it's going to stick, possibly. <laughs> and I don't mean to put him down at all, because I think he's, um, and still is, because he's still with us, an amazing, amazing man, you know. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's given so many filmmakers a start in the industry. Exactly. You know, exactly. Yeah. if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have Jack Nicholson. Exactly, quite. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, and you're right. I mean, there are still, you, you know, people like Jason Blum and whatever nowadays are doing the sort of, uh, you know, the, the lower budget um, mm. films and, 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 and giving sort of up and coming independent filmmakers an opportunity with, with, with those. I know that they're largely in the sort of horror genre or thriller mm. genre, but, um, 
but 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 you know yes yeah, so, so it is out there and it, it, i'm you know i'm not saying it can never be captured again but i think at the same time it was kind of a a a, a unique time um mm. in terms of the actual business side of things uh but yeah it's 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 uh it's an interesting one for sure yeah yeah who wants to go first then with their with their pick for movie we we usually go with heaven first and then hell at the end so um <laughs> who, who wants to first? go first say again ben do you want to go first mark or do you want me to um i've no preference mate i can i can go if you like I'm fine yeah okay um Okay, so we start starting off with my heaven, are we? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Really, really difficult to pick um, something from the seventies. As I said earlier, um, Enter the Dragon was a big one for me purely because of the um, inspiration it was for me to actually begin martial arts, which actually changed my, my life completely. But uh, I had to go with the horror. I had to go with the horror film because that's my favourite genre. And again, seventies was packed packed of them really, like your yeah, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and some some great ones. But I'm going to go with Halloween. John Carpenter. Halloween. Mm. Um, Love it. Yeah, it's my favourite. So, um, yeah, that's that's my that's my seventies movie heaven, without a doubt. Okay. Do Do you remember when, when and how you first saw it? Um, I would have been young because I I was quite fortunate that I had parents that didn't really uh, censor what I watched, which is probably why I'm a little bit scarred <laughs> now to some things. To yeah. <laughs> but I'd I would, say that definitely. Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, ben, Ben's been in my office and I've got pictures of uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Jason Voorhees, Mike Myers, Freddy Krueger all over the walls, the <laughs> painting of Alfred Hitchcock. It's all very horror themed. But yeah, I wouldn't that's have, that's yeah. why I only get two hours sleep when I'm in the spare room. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I, I wouldn't have been very old at all. Um, I think it, it, it was came out in 78. So I was born in 74. And I wouldn't have been four years old, but I would say I was probably around, oh God, I'm trying to think when it would have been out probably 10 maybe maybe even younger so i wouldn't have been very old at all but it's a film i watch even now regularly much in order to my wife it's on uh it's on the playlist all the time i just think it's great no it's well it, we, we 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 talk about carpenter uh yeah. quite a lot and and yeah from, from my point of view from the horror side of things um halloween is 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 definitely one of those uh you know benchmark films and uh, i love it and i've got great fondness because uh, i've said this before so i'll make it brief but i i saw it on um home video uh one one christmas actually and uh my my mum and dad were pretty good as well with the um with the whole letting me watch you know the censorship sort of sort of side of things yes. and uh we actually had halloween one and two nice. and we watched them as a double bill on, oh. on uh, VHS so this was sometime, I guess, in the early 80s. Um, yeah. And, um, uh, you, you know, I remember being blown. I mean, you, you know, I was freaked out by Michael Myers uh, and stuff. And, and But I was also absolutely fascinated the way that one film ended and then the second film picked up immediately where the first one ended and i'd never yeah. seen anything like that before so um y y you know that uh that 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 always stayed with me and and i and i loved it so um a, a it's really good one it's really interesting john carpenter never because the ending obviously leaves itself open for a sequel straight away but that apparently was never on their thoughts it wasn't something that at the time was that popular sequels of horror films and a film exactly. that was a murderer running around they thought well no one's going to see this and and as far as sort of films they all go it was a low budget a very low budget um well uh, yes it had the record for uh the most money earned from a low budget uh feature but before blair yes. witch came along yeah. correct yeah yeah Cause i think the budget was around well i mean it done well, still a lot of money but around three hundred thousand dollars i think the budget was mm. it went on to make millions you know oh yeah really and, it, and it started i mean it did it start its own you know, franchise, not just yep. for the Halloween sequels, but also, you, you know, Friday the 13th and Nightmare yep. on Elm Street and all these yep. things came directly out of what Halloween had set up. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued and I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Um, obviously, 
this year, 2018, we're going to get a new Halloween film. It's kind of like Halloween, you know, H40, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm wondering, because uh, I've not been able to find this out, whether it's a, whether it includes, because I know it ignores most of the sequels, but will it be 40 years on from the end of Halloween 2? Right, or will it be forty years on from the end of Halloween? Mm. And and I've not been able to sort of find out, um, a, you know, a satisfactory answer about that. Uh, do do you guys have any thoughts on that, or or whether they should even do this at all? Um, I I have, I'm one of these that I kind of always, whenever I see them, I moan and I say, oh, why are they why are they doing that again? And I don't think they should be doing like these remakes or um, sequels so, so much. But at the same time, I'll, I will watch it, and it may well. It's not going to be as good as the first one. I'll be very surprised if it is. But the chances are, I will probably enjoy it as well, because mm. I just like those types of films. And you stick Michael Myers in pretty much anything. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> so, what do you think of the remake then? Um, the Rob Zombie one. Yeah. Um, wasn't a fan actually, if I'm honest. Um, no, wasn't a huge fan. I'm not. I'm not going to criticise as a film. It was. I'm not saying it's a bad film necessarily. You know, am I to criticise? Sort of Rob Zombie, really, but yeah, I'm just such a. It's so difficult when I'm such a fan of the original. I'm always yes. going to watch it and just keep going. Yeah, when the original was this, and and it's it's not a fair comparison, really. So yeah, it's difficult. But uh, yeah, I absolutely adored the first one. Loved it, and the yeah. second one I thought was good film. Not so hot on the third. Well, it's a bit of a cult film now, isn't it? Well, it is. That's when it was going to be an anthology. Um, is that season of the Witch or something. Season That's, of the Witch. Yeah. 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 In it is he. Well, apart from no, the TV. he's not. Apart from apart from on the ad on the t you know the 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 in joke ad on the TV for Halloween, but yes. uh, but um, no, I mean you, you know Carpenter still produced that film, and uh, you know that was you know obviously it's very vogue now, but at the time you know the idea was was that every Halloween you were going to have a an anthology a, you know a different film like an anthology of films. Um, under the Halloween banner, but obviously Michael Myers was so, uh, such a popular, um, you know, uh, <laughs> movie maniac as it were that, uh, they, they decided to, you know, pick up and carry on with that and, uh, have been doing so ever since, you know? Um, but yeah, with the Rob Zombie one, um, yeah, I thought it was well made and, oh, you know, yeah. it homaged the first film in some good ways. But I did think he kind of missed the point because with the Rob Zombie ones, you kind of, you know, Michael Myers was the character that we got to sort of know and, and empathize with. And he made all of the other characters utterly <laughs> despicable human yeah. beings. Mm. So <laughs> instead, we were actually on Michael Myers' side. And it was <laughs> like, I don't think that was actually the point of the original <laughs> film. <somewhere>. Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't realize up until a few years ago that, um, that the, the, the mask was actually William Shatner mask. That's right, which makes me love it even more. That's great. <laughs> oh my god, I've not spotted that for like years. Yeah, no, they were so they were so low budget that that all they could do was that you know there was a party shop that had yeah a, a Captain Kirk William Shatner mask and. Yes. All they could really do was was cut the eyes out of it and put some sort of black material in there and then um, spray it white and and yeah. there you go and it's it's iconic and and I'm loving the fact that it is the shat I just think that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. What about you, Ben? Uh, have you got thoughts on Halloween? Yes, love it, love it. Uh, yeah, I first saw it um, on VHS. Um, Around a friend's house, I think I would. Um, obviously, I was not old enough to be watching it, but um, yeah, it definitely did stay with me. Um, I haven't seen either of those, I must admit, for a long time the first and the second one, but I remember watching them. And you know, I like being scared by films, and they did the trick. Um, mm. And uh, great, great actors, you know, and that sort of stuff as well. Um, Again, 70s was a great era for, for horror films. I mean, I like films like The Omen as well, I have to say. That's great. The great original movie. Omen is, is probably one of my favourite ones. But, um, we love again, Richard Donner. You, I think, yeah, yeah I, I think filmmakers like Halloween because it was a low-budget film and it was very successful and it's still remembered all these years later, you know. Mm. 
and Donald Pleasant's awesome. Oh, awesome. Fantastic actor. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. So mm. it's a great pick. Love it. Any excuse to get to talk about, uh, you know, Halloween and Carpenter and whatever is always, um, is always welcome. So thank mm. you for that. <laughs> thank you. So, so, so Mr. Shockley. Yes. I wonder what you pick. <laughs> well, it's no great surprise. Um, I did, obviously, there were so many films I love in the 70s, so it was very difficult to pick one, actually, um, particularly of sort of Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds, people like that. I mean, I almost picked Deliverance. Um, oh, I, almost picked, I almost picked The Outlaw Jays of Wales. But because, because of the, um, I wanted to sort of talk about a film that inspired the thoughts behind the blazing cannons really um i'll I'll pick dirty harry fantastic Um, Mm. i just think it's a class movie um i pretty much love every scene in it uh the actors apart from clint you know you've got harry gordino uh john vernon people like that who uh john mitchum who um is robert mitchum's brother um who clint ended up using several times in other films um the great Don Siegel, obviously. Um, I mean, there's many, there's many rogue cop movies, but I just happen to think, well, this is my favourite one, really. And, well, this and set Robinson. the template as well, did they? Well, yeah, those and, rogue cop movies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and Andy Robinson gave, I think, probably an Oscar-worthy performance. Um, yeah. And it's such a shame he didn't. I don't think he got nominated, but. It's not, I mean, it hasn't affected his career. I mean, I know he still works, but because he was so good in that film, uh, it probably did have a bearing on, on what he did after that for a while. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's great because we've got yet another, in your pick, Star Trek connection there because <laughs> you've got Andrew Robinson yes. and the fact that he sings Row, Row, Row Your Boat with the, <laughs> with the, with the kids on the bus. So, That's right. Wow, it's connecting right. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, in, you know, there was all there was talk about, um, you know, Dirty Harry being, you know, it was kind of political and everything that he was a fascist and all this kind of stuff. And and when Clint gets interviewed, you know, as you know, he says, you know, I just thought it was a fantastic cop drama or something yeah, like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Now, I, I, I was lucky enough to go see Clint. This was probably, oh, God, at least a decade ago, if not more, mm. probably about 15 years ago now at the BFI. Yeah, yeah. Um, when he was interviewed, I was very lucky. I, you know, I, I really wanted to get in and I, I managed to get a spot and, um, mm. uh, it was actually, it was, what film was it that was, uh, playing? I'm trying to think cause it, it, it was following, it was a Q and a with him following a screen mystic river is, what oh, yeah. is when it was. So yeah, whatever yeah. year that was. And, um, yeah, they, they talked about dirty Harry and you're absolutely mm. right. You know, the, the uh, the journalists were trying to be all clever, asking you know mm. about political you know satire of the times and all this sort of thing. And he did. He just turned around and said, "I just thought it was a great detective story." Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was like, "Yay!" And that got an applause. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can read any. You know, as we know, you can read anything to any films. I mean, you know, there's even. A, I just think it's original in the fact that even. I mean. This the, the 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 killer in the film, the psycho. Um, he he's wearing a peace badge on his belt. Yeah, not many people think about that for a for a character, mm. Mm. which is why I wanted to do a bit of a nod in the uh, Blazing Cannons because I don't yeah. know if people know this, but I am wearing the C D C N D badge now. I'm a pacifist myself. I don't I don't go into war and all this sort of stuff. But I just thought it was a really intriguing idea to have the killer, you know, wearing this, wearing this peace badge because it was the seventies and San Francisco was very sort of liberal left wing kind of, you know, um, at the time and probably still is really. Um, but I, I just, no, I just think it was just a fantastic film. I actually watched it last night again and, oh, um, wow. just love it. I mean, yeah. I can't fault it. I mean, it's really annoying when, and I know we've all seen them, when you see the films that they put on TV and they've cut them, cut the hell out of them, taken the swearing out, cut the scenes out. And when you actually watch it in its entirety, I think it's still quite a powerful film. Yeah, that's why I have it on Blu-ray, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but uh, I, I think I think for me, I, I, I the first film I saw when I was very young again, and my parents let me watch it was actually, and I've got a great love for it, is Magnum Force. Um, yes, yeah. I, I think I saw that before I ever saw Dirty Harry, and mm-hmm. uh, I kind of loved that because at the time, you know, obviously. David Soul and Robert Ulrich were in it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was kind of like, oh, it's the man from Starsky and Hutch and the man yeah, from yeah. Vegas, you know. No, uh, and I had the little toy corgi cars of, of Starsky and Hutch and Vegas, you know. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it was it was kind of like uh, that, that that was the connection. And uh, obviously that's quite a violent film as well. But um, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, when, when they all came out on VHS as a box set, I yeah. think that's when, you know, I sort of saw all of them and uh, those good old VHS years. And um, yeah. I always thought that, you know, the the first three films in particular were really strong. You know, oh, Dirty great. Harry, um, Magnum Force and, and The Enforcer were, were yeah. fantastic. And yeah. then they went, uh, y- you know, a little bit yeah. that the, the, the other two weren't quite up to uh, yeah. quite up to par. but still fun. Are you saying <laughs> oh, okay. the Deadpool was any good? <laughs> I remember yes. when VHS sort of first came out my dad was a bit of a techie like me and uh, liked all the latest sort of gadgets and he, um, my mum used to work in town and he would get her to rent a video every like Thursday or whatever so this went like they were pretty brand new and we'd get stuff like Jaws and blah blah and I remember um, mum's dad sending her there one night and on the way and get Dirty Harry when she came home dad said did you pick the film and my mum's reply was I'm not getting your pornos for you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice. she, she thought it was a porn film so she wouldn't have it <laughs> Good on. brilliant brilliant well you know dirty harry i suppose yeah yeah, yeah one can see that but uh, <laughs> but you, you know you know e- even those latter films have some excellent iconography and whatever in them and, and certain set pieces are, are oh, really yeah. good and it, it it is a love i mean we we have talked about the dirty harry series um you know, on uh, on our Eastwood podcast that time, mm. but uh, yeah, no, j- just love it. I- I'm just thinking though, a- any any of our millennial listeners are probably going to be VHS. What what are they talking <laughs> about? You know, <laughs> what well, do they great... mean they couldn't download it? <laughs> <laughs> I've just got to mention. I think the bit you meant you probably know. Um, you're mentioning in uh, sudden impact is that fantastic bit right near the end where you see his silhouette and he's got like a halo over his head. Oh, yeah, and the auto mag. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's probably one of the best, well, that's definitely the best shot in the film, I think. And then, well, we've talked about the Deadpool before, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe the your shit out of luck, possibly, you know, with the fortune cookies is quite amusing. <laughs> it's kind of cheesy but funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's, 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 uh, it's it's good. What what about you, Mark? I mean, is is d- d- obviously Dirty Harry is is a, a film you enjoy yeah. as well, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, me and Ben actually watched it a while back together. We came over one evening and watched it, and I can't I can't believe how good it still looks. Just mm-hmm. the cinematography mm-hmm. of it just looks incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah no, it, it, it's great. I, it's not my favourite Clint Eastwood film. That's probably a bit controversial with Ben. Um, <laughs> oh. That, don't have to be high plains drifter, I'm afraid. Oh but no, uh, it's that's, up, that's definitely up there, definitely. It's, uh, it's definitely the second, so yeah, it's great. Well, again, as you say, you've, you've got the horror sort of aspect in High Plains Drifter, haven't you? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an awesome film. Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. No, I agree. No, I agree. I mean, he's 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 you know, career has been amazing and and continues to be, and that's both in front of and behind the camera. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Love yeah. love the guy. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. another excellent pick what, what about you simon when did you first um uh did remember seeing dirty harry was it a long time ago or, or did you see it when you were well, older or? unfortunately well I, I never did see the dirty harry films when i was a kid that was the mm-hmm. one thing my parents didn't let me watch uh but i i got to see the deadpool uh when it came out on vhs uh, I'd watched that a couple of times, and then um, when I started getting into filmmaking, I was then able to get a copy of Dirty Harry, and uh, thankfully it's the first time I actually saw it for, from beginning to end. Because I mean, up to that point, you you know 
what Dirty Harry is because he's it's just part of the, uh, you know, uh, just part of life, you know, just. And so I knew about the lines, you know, um, did I only shoot five or was it six? You know, yeah. go ahead, make my day. You know, we all knew that stuff just from watching TV and comedies and the the amount of times it took the mickey out of it. But, uh, you know, it was great because I actually got to see it first time in widescreen. So, yes. it's just, yeah, yeah it's just, uh, as you say, it's the cinematography is great in it. The performances <laughs> is great in it. And it just, it does hold up. And it's, it's that... F- that first film that really, you know, launched that series, and it's it's a great film. It's never been bettered in any of the mm. other Dirty Harry films. No, and it's got to be one of the best bad guys ever, hasn't it? I mean, yeah, just, mm. yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And 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 you're absolutely right to see it in its uh, proper, you know, two thirty five to one aspect ratio is amazing. Because what one thing I will say, as much as I loved my, uh, you know, Dirty Harry VHS box set back in the day. Um, they they were pan and scan versions. They they weren't cut. They were full length, but they were the yeah. pan and scan versions. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't until much later. I think they may have had a screening or something at the BFI, and uh, you know, got to see it in its in its full yeah uh, glory. And uh, y- you're right. I mean, e- even by today's standards, that that totally holds up. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, I think I saw a pan and scan version the first time on telly, basically, when I saw Dirty Harry. Right, right, yeah. Um, so it was but, probably edited as well then. Yeah, you know? I think it was, and it wasn't until later when I suddenly realised that there were extra... The scenes had been cut or, or, or they'd been shortened, some of the bits. And um, as you know, you know, when you see a pan and scan, you just don't see it all. And it's just... Some of it doesn't make sense until you've seen it in the in its entirety. Mm. But it's still—I mean, I yeah. must have, it must it must have made an impact on me still the first time I watched it. Um, so it was a film that was only going to get better, if you know what I mean. No, I agree. I, uh, yeah, well, I mean that's 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 the thing. I mean that's the wonderful thing when you think of the, that whole sort of VHS era, is y- y- you know we're watching them on you know by today's standards, you know tiny. T- tiny television screens mm. you know mono sound and all this yet still was absolutely captured by it now mm. that's that that that's the sign of a good story and sure. and a, and good characters and 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 good filmmaking isn't it mm. so you yeah. know yeah excellent all right well that that's that's the 70s utopia then <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, but but you know for for ev- for every good film there's there's at least a dozen bad ones <laughs> so <laughs> so so what what are you, what are your picks for movie hell then? Should I go, Ben? Yeah, came okay, up. Yeah. Um, so again, this is an odd one, but it's it's a film. Um, not many seem to seem to remember it when I kind of have a chat about it. But a film called The Brood, nineteen seventy nine, I believe, late seventies again. David Cronenberg. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Horror. Oliver Reed. Um, And the reason I'm picking it isn't because I think it's a bad film. It's because it absolutely terrified me as a kid. And again, I wasn't very old (laughs) because my parents just got it and said, oh, this will be a nice film for me to keep me quiet for the night. (laughs) Bloody hell. Really? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. And it haunted me for years to the point that I hadn't watched it again up until about maybe three years ago. Right. And my wife had heard me talk about it for years and years. And it, yeah, it's just a bizarre film. Gets in my head for some reason. And uh, yeah, so that's why it's my hell. So I'm not criticising it and saying it's a poor film. It's just, it's not a pleasant film, <laughs> particularly at that age, because I said I wouldn't have been very old. No, I mean, well, the, I mean, there's a big difference when we talk horror. There's a big difference between something like Halloween, which, yes, is is scary and got a maniac serial killer sort of stabbing people and stuff, which is which is nasty on one level. But, you, you know, the, the, the brood is nasty on a whole nother level, isn't it? I mean, that's yes. the, 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 the psychology going on behind that film is just you know, well, I mean, I, I never saw that as a child and I'm bloody glad I didn't. <laughs> it's, it's the very, that scene where you, um, where she goes into a kitchen. I don't know. Have you guys seen it recently? I know. The not scene. recently. I haven't. No, so I, I've, I've not seen it at all. 
So you know, there's oh. like the, uh, the horrible little children, like the yeah. little. Well, they look like little girls, but they're actually, they're actually not. Um, so they, it, <laughs> it goes into a kitchen, and this all looks very normal, and it's all great. And I'm sitting there thinking this is going to be a lovely film. And also, now we open the kitchen cupboards, and this little kid kind of dives out the cupboard above the above the uh, kitchen unit and just starts attacking this woman, and uh, I think she ends up killing her. And that's like it was in the first, it's like the very beginning of the film. It just absolutely scarred me to the point that that evening I wouldn't go into the kitchen. And um, yeah, it was horrible. And then there's, there's the bit where the two two little kids again go into the school class and kill the teacher, and yeah. the girl plays like the main role in it, just emotionless, doesn't react to it, just horrible. And Oliver Reed's awesome in it, absolutely amazing in it. Yeah, I was going to say, on one end, you've got, like, obviously, the, 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 the creepy, sort of scary, nasty kids and stuff. But on the other hand, you've got all the, uh, you know, the, 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 the psychology uh, going on there is some pretty fucked up stuff. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's the yeah. stuff Cronenberg loves, isn't it? You know, <laughs> he's, the master. he's the master at it. And, and I hadn't really, when I watched it again, I picked up on the scoring. I was like, the scoring. Oh, it's how, is it Howard Shaw? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he did. I think he did pretty much every David Cronenberg film. I think there was one or one or two he didn't do, but pretty much everything. Yeah, and he did like the Lord of the Rings, Sons of Lambs, all sorts. But yeah, and I hadn't obviously appreciated that as a kid. But going back to it now, just even the score is phenomenal, just brilliant. I know it's meant to be movie hell when I'm, I'm telling you all the nice <laughs> stuff about it, but it's hell in the way that it just it's haunting. I find you need oh, to you, you need to watch it again, Ben. Yeah, I, I will. I will. I did. I did see it a long time ago, and I do remember um, fairly being fairly terrified at the time. I have to say, yeah, yeah. yeah it's awful. Well, there's, there's actually two versions of it. There's a um, oh wow, uh, the UK version. I think it's ah. about eighty eighty eight minutes or something. But then oh. there's a the the US version's about ninety five minutes. Oh, so wow. there's a bit of extra, and it's got some yeah, it's got some really nasty stuff at the end. Oh. So. Uh, um, because I know there was a scene they cut out where the the um, is a Nola I think played by Samantha Regler. She's licking. Yes. Like these, these things have been born. She's licking them. That's <laughs> right. And there's more of that in the uh, in the in the uncensored version or whatever, which is which is. I mean, it's it's really it really is fucking disturbing stuff. <laughs> but 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 it, but it's, it's interesting because both of your um your picks your your horror picks if you like um. You, you know, again, we we see them as kids and we see them just sort of for what they are when we're kids and don't necessarily understand that, you, you know, the craft, if you like, the craftsmanship behind them. But, you know, both of those you picked have amazing scores, which which totally add to the, um, you, you, you know, the creepiness of the films. I yeah. mean, the Halloween score, simplistic as it just, is, is incredible. Mm. And uh, likewise, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, mm. so there's okay. a lot about remake apparently as well of the Brood, but I think oh, it's kind of, if it's happening. Yeah, yeah. So I've read something about that a while back, but not not for a while. But mm, not and sure. Simon, this this is a really unique situation because you're you're the man that I'm always amazed has seen absolutely everything. <laughs> so we found the one film that you haven't fucking seen. My God. <laughs> You'll find there's quite a few films I haven't seen. Bloody hell, you've seen an awful lot, though, Simon. Yes. I have to say, I'm always like, bloody hell, you've seen everything. Uh, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Well, I, as I learnt back in film school, there's for for that guy who's seen every film, there is that one film that he hasn't seen, and everybody else true. has. Yeah. No, no. You are well, like Mark Commode's always saying, who's obviously seen loads of films but uh he said he'll never catch up ever and that's that's the trouble we won't we'll never ever no. catch up you know it's there's so much out there and being made all the time so uh but I don't even that's know what's cool about it. it i don't even know if i want to recommend the brood or not <laughs> <laughs> i'm not <laughs> i don't know that's how i feel about it it's, i mean you know. i mean cronenberg's another you know you know we're always talking about the the letter c when we're doing our sort of A to Z thing, you know, there's, there's some letters that, you know, are really hard to find directors, but you know, <laughs> the letter C the the, 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 the list goes on and on and on. And, uh, yeah, you know, right. Cronenberg, we, we haven't talked about him in any depth. Um, 
I think Mike Tack picked one of his films um, on one of our horror podcasts as as a, as a heaven. But um, you, you, you know, he's. I think it was the Dead Zone, if memory okay. serves. That's um, right. Yeah, for our Stephen King one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but um, but you, you, you know, uh, another guy, another another really, really um, intriguing director there with a uh, with with some real, yeah, some real. He's, he's done a I want to say things. good movies, uh, mm-hmm. great movies, but y- you know some of them really quite fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> talk about sort of, I don't like remakes, but then Cronenberg did 1986's the version of The Fly, didn't he? Yes, he did, which I love. That she's just fantastic as a oh, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I love I love that mm-hmm. film. I think that's absolutely fantastic movie. But that's a, a whole other podcast. So a video yeah, drum, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> he's he's made some great films, and he's a unique filmmaker because he he deals with that kind of you know the icky side of the things. body horror. Yeah, yes, yeah. Ugh. absolutely. No, no. Well, that's a whole other podcast someday, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. But, uh, but but Ben, what what about you then? What is what is seventies movie hell from from your perspective? Well, it it wasn't a film I was aware of at the time, um, but I caught it late one night. Oh, it must have been fifteen, twenty, probably twenty years ago or something. I watched it on. It was on about half ten, eleven o'clock, I think. And it has the title "Blazing Magnum." <laughs> Ah, thought, well, there you go. It relates. This is either going to be absolutely fantastic or absolutely fucking diabolical. And I gave it a watch anyway. And it is totally ridiculous. It's It was made in about 1976, so kind of around the Enforcer kind of time. Um, he's definitely trying to be Dirty Harry. Um, actor Stuart Whitman is in it. John Saxon, Martin Landau. Okay, well, honey cut, so a, a yeah, great it, cast. it's got a good cast absolutely yeah. it's got a really good cast but it's a bit of a cheesy film isn't it yeah and there's i have to say there is a, an absolutely fantastic car chase in it yeah um, I, i've yet to see that i only well, got i only got about halfway chase. through <laughs> yeah well there's one near the beginning and there's one later on which is quite a long sort of and it's i think that was directed by a stunt guy called reme julian or someone and i believe um there's another guy called tom sutton and one of them went on to do stunts on the Bond movies. Oh right! In the in the nineties, so um, he came he came out of it quite well. Um, but it's just it's just such an obvious Dirty Harry ripoff. And um, what what sold me on it was the title, which when we um, started talking about what film we were going to do next, Mark and I, and we mentioned about the you know doing a detective film. This came into my mind. I went Blazing Magnum. And I was like, why can't we call it Blazing Magnums or something? And I thought, well, maybe there'd be a copyright problem. And then I thought, well, it's got to be Blazing something. And there's obviously <laughs> Blazing Saddles. Um, there's Blazing Bullets, which is a Western from the 50s. Um, I think there was a movie called Loose Cannons, which I think was an 80s or 90s cop movie, I believe. Um I wanted to call it bucking magnums, but uh, I wasn't sure if people would understand what bucking meant, as in, you know, the movement of the gun. So that's, I think, we decided on the Blazing Cannons because it's such a ridiculous title. Yeah, um, That's a good title. I like well, that. it is, but it's also <laughs> it's so macho, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> but that's what makes it work, I think, the title. Um, but, I mean, the Blazing Magnum film is also called Shadows in an Empty Room. No idea why. <laughs> Absolutely yeah, no the idea. version I saw on YouTube was called that. Yeah, I think, the I think link they were trying to make it more classy. Um, but the problem is, I mean, if ever people ever see it, I mean, there's two absolutely ridiculous fight scenes in there for no reason at all, which is also probably an inspiration for our fight scene in um, Lady <laughs> Cannon. But there's a ridiculous fight where he turns up, this guy, this detective turns up at this, this, this house that three transvestites are living in, and he decides to beat them all up. Um, <laughs> it was a different no time, why. Ben. It was hey? a different time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, the memories. Um, yeah. And there was another fight scene where he's supposed to go to this locker and pick something up, a piece of jewellery or something, I think, and it's being staked out by other cops. And he opens the door, and all of a sudden these cops come out of nowhere and they have a big fight. And it's almost like um, Stuart Whitman or whoever has just gone... Oh, we need another fight. I need another fight scene here, and they've just put one in. 
Yeah, you know, because it was almost like, well, we've gone 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and I haven't done a fight yet, so I think we should put one in. And um, it was things like that that obviously I remembered from all those years ago <laughs> and and thought, well, this is time to re- to watch this movie again and, and sort of, you know, get inspired. But what I'm saying is Dirty Harry obviously is a class movie. I think they set out to make a class movie here. But what it's turned out is, in a way, something that we're kind of taking the piss out of in Blazing Cannons. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Have, have any of the rest of you guys seen this? I bet you no. haven't. No, Ben's <laughs> told me about it a few times. We talked about it when we were obviously doing Cannons, but no, I haven't, I haven't watched it yet. Well, so I don't think I'd enjoy it, though. That's the problem. I've got news for you. I've got it on Blu-ray. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I you, hope it's a slightly yeah. better picture quality than the, as I said, I, I, I wanted to, I didn't get time to watch the whole thing, but to get a flavor of it, I did watch a bit of it on, on YouTube. And uh, unfortunately the quality, it was obviously recorded off some, it was recorded off some television broadcast on VHS and, uh, yeah. The, the, the quality of what I saw. I don't even think the timing was right. It was all sort of out of <laughs> sync and everything. But the so I'm hoping perfect. the Blu ray is polished, you know? Well, <laughs> it's exactly the same. You can't polish a turd, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it says brand new 2015 HD Master. Wow. Oh, original trailer. Oh, that's right. It's just a trailer that's that's been remastered. <laughs> But there's some other classic 70s trailers on here, which which is why I'm going to bring it up, Mark, when I see you, because uh, I think there's some inspiration coming here. Mm. That's good. Oh, sounds <laughs> excellent. Sounds excellent. Cool. <laughs> well, I, as I said, I find it very difficult to, in a way, to, to, to wholly criticise a film from the 70s. So, as I said, there's some good acting performances in it. Um, it's just the script is a bit dodge. God, you, you two are just like me. Your movie hells always have a bunch of caveats around them, don't they? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same. I never want to ever slag anything off, and I'm like, oh well, you know, yeah. it's it, it's this or that. But um, but that's, hey, that's why you've got me on the show. <laughs> that's right, Simon. Yeah, Simon doesn't pull any punches, do you, Simon? You don't Good care. cop, bad cop, I suppose that is. Hey, you bring it full circle. I like hey. it. That's it. it. Nice link. So, so listen, guys. I, I, I'm conscious of time. I know you've you've, mm-hmm. you've got to go. Um, but before you do, uh, where where can where can people find out more about uh, the Blazing Cannons or any other work that you're involved in? I'll let Ben answer this one because Ben's Ben's um, a lot more social media savvy than me, so he's, he's you can find him all over the place. Oh, okay. Then. <laughs> yeah, well, I obviously I do up, do put updates on um, Facebook, my own my own website, um, a little bit of Twitter, but mainly Facebook and my own website really. So, and what is that? BenShockley.com? dot com? Is it? That yeah, way? it's www dot ben, benshockley dot com. You can also find it on dot co dot uk actually as well. It's on Yola, basically. It's a Yola site. Okay. Um, so you can find it on Ben Shockley Yola as well. That should come up. Um, so most updates come up, up on there. I know that Mark has got a website, but is that's that's being redone, isn't it, at the moment? It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not something I tend to spend as much time on as I should really. Like I'm not on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or anything, unfortunately. But we've also got um, got good people out there who are, are championing our film as well. I mean, in Britflix as well, mm. uh, they often put updates for us on there. Oh, and Stuart Wright. Us, hmm? Stuart Wright is that? Well, it's Stuart? actually John Baker, the other guy. Okay. Because he lives locally to me, he came up and saw the film as well, and he really, really liked it, and he gave it a really nice review. And I also, um, yeah. Yeah, and also Mark sent it to um, the British Comedy Guide, um, and they've they've given us a really nice little quote as well. So it's things like that that, that really help, you know, advertise our independent film. You know. Okay, well we'll, we'll have to keep uh, our listeners updated. Um, you know, as as to you know, if you keep us in the loop as to um, you know when and where this can be. Uh, this can be screened um or found on on home media or whatever then we'll uh, we'll make sure we spread the word for sure cool. and we'll get the we'll get the um the um trailer up and running as soon as we can too so that's another another thing to look out for and i'll stick that on on facebook and probably youtube as well probably perfect so, excellent yeah. cool 
So, Keith, where can people find your work? Uh, yeah, you can uh, you can find me if you go to YouTube and put in British Isles. That's E Y L E S, as in my last name. Uh, there are some short films that I've made there. Um, also, a, a little bit of news, um, and Ben's involved in this as well, is we just finished this past weekend. Uh, we wrapped on a web series called Rebecca Gold, which is uh, directed by our good friend Ian David Diaz, who's, mm-hmm. who's been very loyal and cast myself yeah. and Ben uh, yeah. in, in, in several projects. Um, that web series obviously will be coming soon, and hopefully we'll have a an episode of movie heaven movie hell where we can cover that as well indeed and uh, as always you can find my work on at independentrunnings.com uh you can find this podcast on itunes stitcher youtube and all good podcast providers uh you can follow us on facebook and twitter just for uh just search movie heaven movie hell and please leave us a rating and review on itunes and stitcher it all helps so that just leaves me to thank our guests, uh, Ben and Mike, uh, Mark. Thanks very much. Thank you. Had a fantastic time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah. Cheers, all. It's been great. And, uh, and I hope that you, the listener, join us again for the next episode of Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. <laughs>